I also forgot to mention that Chris, Kristen is just getting over her cold too. Just keep her in your prayers and also keep Betty in your prayers. Um, just an update on the baby. He's still in Betty. Um, so I just, <laughs> I just, just pray that it goes well. Uh, any, any day now, the due date is the 30th. Uh, so the title of our lesson this morning is a phrase from uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 18. It is, if the righteous one is scarcely saved. I want to focus on that phrase this morning. The whole passage reads like this, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 18. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? The verse prior to that one in verse 17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So I want you to consider uh, the day of judgment when all of mankind must stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, as the Bible talks about. Uh, Re- Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 says that both small and great will stand before God and the books will be open and the dead will be judged out of the things that were written in the books according to their works. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We'll all stand there. We'll all be individually judged by ourselves, by Jesus Christ himself. So there will be nobody who is unaccounted for on that day. I want you to consider that not only the wicked will be judged, but the righteous will be judged according to their life that they've lived on the earth. Uh, The righteous in Scripture is another name for followers of God, those who attempt to follow God. It's not that anyone will stand before God righteous of their own accord, but through obedience and faithfulness, they will have to be accounted righteous and fully righteous before God on his account. Uh, And some will stand uncondemned. Hopefully those in this room, we will stand uncondemned having been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So the question at hand will be, number one, who has become a child of God spiritually? Not everybody in this world are children of God in a spiritual sense, though they are in a physical sense. So who has become a child of God spiritually by obeying the gospel? Number one. Number two, who among the righteous will be found faithful? That's the question for us that we always ask ourselves. Will I be found faithful? The question for those who have become Christians will is, will I be found faithful or unfaithful? Jesus' condition for the children of God who have become Christians is, be thou faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Walk in the light, and you will remain cleansed. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. So yes, there will essentially be two groups of people on that day. And you you go to Matthew chapter 25 where he separated the two groups, the sheep from the goats, as they all, all the nations stood before him. Uh, And there will be those who have obeyed the gospel, who stand before the judgment seat. There will be those who have not obeyed the gospel, who stand before the judgment seat. First off, which group would you rather be in, standing before the judgment seat of God? So those who obeyed have a fighting chance of making an end. Uh, If their walk has been found faithful and that God can find them faithful. But even among those who are called out, that is the church, the ecclesia in the Greek of of Christ, that is the church, some will be found falling short. Uh, Yes, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1, the Hebrew writer says to baptize believers, just like those of us in this room. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Uh, The urge is don't don't fall short. Make sure we're faithful. Make sure we're staying on the straight and narrow path. Don't fall off of it. Don't uh, veer from it. So no, we don't have to be perfect. But yes, we have to be faithful. So first consider the thought from uh, verse 17 of 1 Peter chapter 1 before our main verse. Peter says this, For the time has come for judgment to begin where? at the house of God. Now what in scripture is spiritually the house of God? That's the church of God, the church of Christ. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 references, quote, uh, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. 
So Jesus will be, uh, judgment will be administered by Jesus first and foremost to who on that day? To those of us who are in the church. We will be judged on that day. Those who are added to Christ's church will stand and be judged as those who have obeyed the gospel. Uh, we will be judged on whether or not we stayed faithful till that co- to that covenant that Jesus gave to which we agreed to. Uh, and if we're not found faithful, we will not enter in. Uh, remember in uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, Paul's plea for Christians to stay faithful. And he gives us all a warning just to stay in the straight and narrow. He says, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell in times past, they received severity. But toward you, Christians, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Sadly, there will be some within the Lord's church on that day who will not make it past the judgment seat of Christ to the Father because they lived in darkness while being part of the Lord's church. That is possible. You can come into this building every week and yet be lost. Where in the name of Christ? You can still be lost, of which we need to be careful. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, the famous passage, Not everyone who simply says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? Not just because you say you're a follower of me are you going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Uh, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? And by the way, these aren't atheists, are they? They'll say, Lord, haven't we? But we've spent our whole life prophesying in your name, casting out demons in your name. And we've done many wonders in your name. We could add 21st century language there. You know, we, we came to church every Sunday. We, we evangelized. We, we did this and that. And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So they weren't staying in the straight and narrow. So the sad understanding that we're studying is that many who would call themselves Christians uh, will not make it on that day. So let it not be said of those of us in this room. Matthew chapter 22, you see a parable of the wedding feast. And we often study the different groups in that parable. First, there were those who were invited who outright rejected the invitation to come. Right? They had other things to attend to. I'm going to go do this or that. And they said, I can't come. They represent the sinners of this world who laugh at the invitation of obeying the gospel to come to heaven. And they don't even think about coming, many of them. They reject the invitation. They don't even try. The second group are those who did accept the invitation. Right, you remember it went out far and wide, and they, he said, just invite everybody now, now that they have uh, rejected it. Invite the lame, the, the maimed, the blind, everybody in society. Give them all an invite. And these are those who came to the wedding, are those who are, uh, are members of the Lord's church. Right? Those who took up Christ on his salvation, they said, I want to go to the wedding. I will accept this invitation. But do you remember a third group? Mentioned in the parable? Verse 10 says, when you see the scene of the wedding hall, it says it was filled with guests. That was those who came. But when the king came in and he saw the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Now notice, this, guy, this wasn't someone who said, I don't want to come. He said, I'll be there. In the parable, the man is depicted who did not have on the proper attire, Evidently, something in the parable that was very unacceptable, very offensive to this king. Uh, So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? In other words, that's unacceptable in the parable. And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There are some on that day who will have wished they could have come to the wedding feast. They tried to come to the wedding feast, and they accepted the invitation, so to speak, but they won't be found worthy to enter in. Uh, This group represents those within the Lord's church who were not found faithful. That's who this represents. Those who started the trek toward heaven, but they didn't finish it. They fell short of it. They had hidden sin that they refused to take care of. Maybe people thought they were going to make it, but they didn't make it. God wouldn't let them in. And 2 Peter chapter 2, and verse 20 says about those type of Christians, says the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. 
For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. So that's a Christian who's just outright, they stop trying in some sense and they start living in darkness. Maybe they're trying to cover it up and hide it. You're not going to get away with that on the judgment day. We have to be faithful. So we come back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, and Peter says to Christians, For the time has come for judgment to begin with us, the house of God. And listen to the rest of the verse here. It says, And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Right? We are those who have obeyed the gospel of God. What about them? Uh, did you catch that sentiment? If we are going to be judged in the church, those who would be called Christians, those who are called the righteous, and we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if he's going to examine our records to see if we're faithful, by which some will fall short, what is to be said to those who haven't obeyed the gospel at all? You know, what, is, uh, what about those who haven't even tried, who are out there living in sin, and what's, what's to be said of them? The implication is that they won't have a chance in the world who didn't obey the gospel of God. And now listen to our theme verse, verse 18, which is actually a quote from Proverbs 11, verse 31. It says, now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So the sentiment here is if the righteous are barely squeaking by, so to speak, on the coattails of God's grace that he was letting them in, don't you realize that those outside of the church of God have no chance? That's what he's teaching. One website said this, said the righteous will only squeak by in the judgment. That is, they will scarcely be saved. Even the most noble of God's servants throughout times past have fallen into sin. Noah, Moses, David, the apostles... Their salvation in the last day will be by the grace and mercy of God. So when you kind of study this passage, it might make the hair on the back of your neck stand up a little bit in some fear. When you realize that not even those who make it in on that day really deserve to be there. Those who make it on that day did so with difficulty on their part to follow the straight and narrow path. It took a lot of effort. It took a lot of time and energy. And they themselves because of their abilities, were scarcely saved. Not through God's ability. Right? God we can easily save anybody, but a lot of people won't take the way. It is a scarce way. So just for a minute, I want you to look at that word scarcely that's translated there in the New King James and the King James in verse 18, describing the righteous being saved. If, if we look at the word scarcely on Google and look at the definition, it's defined as only just, almost not. Google gave an example sentence using the word, and here's the example sentence. Her voice is so low, I can scarcely hear what she is saying. What's that mean? It means you know, I, I can hardly hear her, just barely. It means I can hear her, but I almost can't. I'm only just hearing her. So consider then the meaning of this passage. Peter is saying the righteous are saved, but just narrowly. Just barely. Almost not are the righteous saved. Let me give you a a few other uh, Bible versions on how this verse is translated. One version says, If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? If the righteous one is saved with difficulty, where will appear the ungodly and the sinner? If it is with difficulty that the righteous are saved, What will become of the godless man and the sinner? And lastly, this version says, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? I think we get the point of what he was saying. It's hard for us to make it into heaven. What's to be said about those out there? So there's a plea, be inside the church. Be faithful. It's a difficult way. It's a straight and narrow. I think this really is a lesson about the straight and narrow way of Jesus Christ, which he talked about in Matthew 7. It's a difficult path. It's a narrow path. Luke writes about the hardships um, of their expeditions at sea, and he, and he uses this word. And um, I'll give you an example of when the Bible uses this New Testament Greek word in Acts chapter 27 and verses 7 and 8. So they're out at sea. 
Luke is there and he writes about how hard this expedition is. He uses this word scarcely as it's translated in the King James Version. Here's the New King James. It says, when we had sailed slowly for many days on the sea, we arrived, here it is, with difficulty off uh, Snidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed. We sailed under the shelter of, of Crete off uh, Salmon. Verse 8, here it is again. Passing it with difficulty, the New King James, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lacia. So we see here that Luke said in this example, uh, you know, we're trying to make our way in the boat, but the winds kept blowing against us so that we barely got to where we needed to go. It was really hard for us to make it through these winds. The King James Version says we scarcely made it through. Right? And uh, look at God looking down on, on them. He was protecting them, but for them it was hard. It wasn't hard for God, but it was really hard for them. And so he said that, you know, we made it, but it was difficult. It, we had to just push to make it through. We almost weren't successful. We felt like we almost didn't make it. We just barely got there. And I think that that's kind of the way the righteous are going to make it to heaven. That's what the Bible's teaching. Uh, do you understand that this is the same word used to describe us pursuing salvation and making it successfully? It's hard. Right, describing a narrow way to heaven. The righteous are, sa are saved, but it's with difficulty. The righteous are saved, but just barely do they make it themselves. What's to be said about those outside the church? So it's a long journey. It's a narrow, difficult commitment to Jesus Christ, and it is a straight and narrow. Now let me just add here. Um, we don't study these kinds of thoughts this morning to take away any peace of mind from those who are being faithful. I want to stress that. Hopefully all those in this room, I don't want the faithful brethren at the Davison to leave here this morning and say, well, that was a discouragement. Travis said we're barely going to enter in. No, listen, if you're being faithful, then you should have that peace of mind and peace of God that passes understanding that the Bible talks about in Philippians 4 and verse 7. We can have that peace. Read the book of 1 John. If you're on the straight and narrow and you're clinging to it and you trust God, you're good. People who were in the boat with Luke and with Paul, they were safe. Right? They had nothing to worry about. But when it's talking about how hard it is, it's talking about from our perspective. If you're barely going to make it in, it's because you're, you're, you're trying to follow that straight and narrow path. God's got you, but a lot of times we leave him. He doesn't leave us. We leave him. That's the point. So, and I don't want you to leave here with anything other than a renewed seriousness for what we're doing and following the path of God. I don't want to scare the faithful. I don't want to take the peace that we should have from those who are actually living faithfully. Um, but for those who are perhaps not living faithfully and those who have sins in their life, if you're trying to hide things and not confess before God or not trying to change and repent, maybe you haven't even obeyed the gospel. I might want to scare you a little bit with this message. Right? Uh, for if the righteous one is scarcely saved, it's a narrow path for them to squeeze in. What's to be said of those who are unrighteous? Right? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. We will not enter in if we are unrighteous. So perhaps you should tremble this morning if you're not right with God and you know that you're not right. We urge you to make yourself right. And we'll talk about how to do that at the end of this lesson. So the Bible simply says, Christians, because of these facts about the difficulty of the straight and narrow path, don't come at this with a half-hearted service. Don't come at this with half of an effort, because it's a hard way. So the way of salvation is difficult to attain to. We need to take it very seriously because it's difficult. But in 1 John chapter 2, which really is kind of the whole message of the book of 1 John, John did encourage the faithful, not trying to be so negative all the time. He said, and now little children abide in him. That means walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. And when he appears, we can have confidence before him and not be ashamed of him at his coming. So that's John's whole message in his book. Christians, don't be scared because you're walking a straight and narrow path. Have confidence in this straight and narrow path. Is it hard? Yeah, it's hard. But have confidence in it. Because if you're faithful, you have eternal life in your very possession. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 10, he said, Therefore, brethren, 
because of this, be even more diligent to make your call on election sure. That is, don't be terrified, just be diligent. Don't just forsake the assemblings. Don't just go out and sin on purpose. He said, be careful that you're on the right path because it's difficult, because it's narrow. There is a balance between being scared and having a righteous fear of, I better make sure that I'm on the right path, but I, I'm safe. I'm good. I'm on God's path. Paul said in First uh, Timothy chapter 6, and verse 12, fight that good fight of faith. Lay a hold on eternal life. That is, make sure you hold in your possession what we're talking about. Don't let it go when you have it. So I think some people just don't really care that much. And it's kind of in the back of their mind. Oh yeah, heaven. Oh yeah, Jesus. Oh yeah, going to church. It's sort of not a priority. You better be careful that you, you will not make it in if, if we have that mindset. So we need to be diligent. You know, I think of somebody drowning in water. Someone throws them a lifeline and the picture is, man, you almost perished there in the water. You almost didn't make it. Right, but a lifeline was extended and you've taken hold of it and you hold on to that with all your might. Cling to it. Don't let it go. So the goal is not to terrify you as you're being saved, but to motivate you. Hold on as hard as you can because the waters are still dangerous until the minute you're pulled up into the boat, which is heaven. We will have to fight this fight of faith until the day that we die. We have to keep diligent to it. And so the Bible says salvation is difficult. For, for humans. Oftentimes in Scripture, those who were saved were part of a faithful select few. Not very many made it. It's going to take a lot of effort. Uh, in, in fact, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So now that we've found it, Follow it with, with strength. Follow it and cling to it. The goal here is to motivate us to take this very seriously. For those who hold on to the lifeline, don't hold on to it loosely. Cling to it. Don't act as though there's not st a st still very real danger in this world. Satan's still tugging on you to try to let go of the lifeline, trying to make you give up, trying to make you sin. Cling to Jesus and cling to his way. So as we continue to study the concept of this verse, that the righteous one is scarcely saved, it's a little bit of a scary word, but let's keep going with this. Let me give you two Bible examples, and we'll see how the righteous were saved in times past and apply it to this uh, verse. I'll call this uh, two times that the righteous, two times that the righteous were saved with difficulty and narrowly evaded destruction. So number one is Lot dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, read with me from Genesis chapter 19. I'll put it up on the screen. Genesis 19, verses 12 through 26. So let's consider Lot's salvation and how he made it out. Uh, the Bible testifies that Lot was a righteous man before God, living in this wicked city of, of Sodom. And he dwelled among very wicked people. But the time came for God to bring judgment upon the wicked. And you remember the story, how the two men, who the Bible says were angels, uh, were, came to visit Lot to bring him out. They came to the household at night. Verse 12 says this, Genesis 19. It says, Then the angels said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, or whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Come back and look at that in just a minute. Verse 15 says, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are with you, lest you be consumed in this punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So they said, come on. You know, look back at verse 16, because I don't think I ever caught this before when I read the, the story. Notice it says that he lingered. 
While he lingered, the men took his hand. The angels took his hand. It seems that Lot and his family were not running out as fast as the angels wanted them to. Perhaps it's like me at my house on a Sunday morning when I'm trying to leave to come to church and I find 50 other things that I have to, to do. I grew up with that, right? <laughs> we always come out, my dad had toast and all this stuff. <laughs> so the text said, said Lot was lingering. He wasn't going fast enough. So the men, the angels of God, took Lot by the hand and said, come on, let's go right now. We've got to get, out. We've got to get you out of here. The destruction's about to start. Verse 17 said, So it came to pass when they had uh, brought them outside that the angel said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay, uh, stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Right, so we see here that Lot and his family were just narrowly evading this destruction because God gave them away. I kind of think about when the Israelites came to the Red Sea. God pushed the waters out for them and said, walk through it. He gave them a duty. He gave them something. He said, walk, go, go as fast as you can. So here, there was a short window of time for Lot and his family to get out of Sodom right before the destruction started. And God gave them a way out of the city. So notice also the effort that was expected by the righteous who were being saved. Right? They were told to escape. They were told to flee and hurry to get out. This surely was a scene that produced sweat on their bodies and heavy breathing in their lungs because they were told to get themselves out of there as fast as they possibly could by the word of the Lord. Verse 22, the angel said again, hurry Escape to the next city, for I cannot do anything until you arrive. Now there, you see God's side of things. Right? I won't start God's destruction. God told me don't start burning up the city until you're out of it. So I've got to make sure you're safe first, and then immediately after, the destruction will start. He had a way for the righteous, and he was going to help the righteous. So don't think that this is some impossible way. We've, we've, I've described it like this uh, recently. It's, it's, it's not a broad path, but it's not a tightrope walk where you're just barely making it or you're, you're tipping over every step of the way. It's called a straight and narrow path. That's the barely getting into heaven. You've got to just follow the straight and narrow. So the part, uh, that part shows us God's complete protection on those who are willing to be saved and to actually follow his way. But it was a narrow way, wasn't it? It was a narrow window. Verse 23 said, uh, The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered into the city of Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Verse 26, But his wife looked behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So we know this story very well. Let's note just a few things about how these were saved. Number one, notice the sons-in-law who were invited to come, but they didn't come. Right? If the righteous is, are scarcely saved, what's to be said of the, God, the ungodly and the sinners? Right? The, and the text says, Lot, when Lot warned them, they didn't take it seriously. They didn't believe him. They thought he was joking. So I can picture the sons-in-law is just... Laughing, not taking it seriously. Number two, notice the four who escaped. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Only four made it out. And then number three, notice Lot's wife, who was turned into a pillar of salt because she turned back. She looked back. Consider that even among those who were running away, one out of the four didn't make it out alive. Oh, she made it further than the sons-in-law. But, you know, they didn't even try to leave the city. But Lot's wife made it part of the way, and she looked back. Her heart turned back, and she likely had a heart that cried out for the city that she used to live in. Perhaps unlike her husband Lot, she was not as disturbed by the conduct of the wicked, and she had an attachment to that city, perhaps. So, yes, it's a, it's a great example of the righteous being narrowly saved. How many among thousands in the city made it out? Only four. How many among the four made it all the way out? Only three. So yes, if the righteous one is 
barely making it out with their lives because they follow the straight and narrow. What is to be said about those who live wickedly? Well, the, this story shows they were destroyed and destroyed promptly. Uh, number two, I want you to consider the destruction of Jerusalem. So this event itself in the New Testament isn't written in Scripture, but it's referred to. Uh, it's foretold in Jesus' prophecies and warnings in Matthew chapter 24. So the way the event would go down in world history in A.D. 70 is that the Roman army, led by Ro- Ro- the Roman governor Titus, would surround the city of Jerusalem, and the people inside would then go through a five-month siege, and most of them would die who stayed inside the city. It was a terrible destruction. They were crucified, different terrible things, burned. Many of them starved. Some of them resorted to cannibalism. It was terrible if you stayed in the city walls for this five-month siege. Interestingly enough, in Matthew chapter 24 and in Luke chapter 21, Jesus gives a warning to his followers about what's coming at the destruction of Jerusalem. Those who would become Christians, he said, if you want to follow my warning, he says, flee to the mountains when you see the city surrounded by armies. So they they start surrounding the the city in AD 70. What had Jesus told them to do? Get out as fast as you possibly can. Right? When you see the armies run for the hills, Luke chapter 21 and verse 20, Jesus tells them, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. Don't come into Judea or try to come to Jerusalem, for these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So we see another example of a narrow opening of time given to the faithful uh, where those who would heed Jesus' word could be spared. Verse uh, 17, he told them, "Let let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything from his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to his house to get his clothes. Right? Get out. Get out of there. So when you realize that the time has come and you see Jerusalem surrounded, don't wait. You will have a narrow window of time when the armies will not stop you. If they see you running out, they'll let you go and make it out with your life. So don't go back and take a bag from your house. Don't go back and get more clothes. Leave instantly or perish is what they were told to do. Now, secular history, if you go look at this, um, secular history tells us that not one follower of Jesus Christ lost their life at the destruction of Jerusalem. Why not? They fled to the hills. The the armies came, they said, Jesus said, get out. Jesus said, get out of here. Because when they saw the city surrounded, they fled. And what a destruction it was for those who actually stayed inside. Those who didn't believe Jesus stayed inside the city. So yes, if the righteous narrowly make it out with their lives, what is to be said about the wicked who refused the gospel? So as we close here this morning, I want to give you three summarizing truths about a difficult salvation. The Bible says our salvation is difficult. Let's make three closing remarks. Number one, I want to clarify again. It is not difficult with God. It is difficult with man. Uh, you know, when we say, oh, the righteous will barely make it out alive, or it is difficult to be saved, rest assured that the scripture is not saying salvation is difficult for God. It's not that God had you and, oh, I, I, I lost you. It's not on God's part that it's difficult. And it's not hard for God to save the righteous. But it lies on the part of man where the difficulty comes into play. You remember the angels uh, when they told Lot, said, God will, you know, God will not start the destruction until you make it out. Therefore, hurry. So that meant God was going to wait on them. He was going to do his part fully to get them out. And for them, it was hard. For them, it was a scary ordeal. But God knew the whole time that they were going to be fine if they just followed his way. So this was not difficult for God, although it was difficult for Lot and his family. Although they felt like they were narrowly evading the destruction, which in one sense they were, God knew that he had their back. Once the brimstone started coming down, that they were going to be saved. So no, when God provides a way of safety, if we actually take it and take it promptly, 
we're actually in no danger at all in that sense. And although it seems difficult for the time being, God never gives the righteous anything that is too overbearing to do. But we do see there is a part on man. He says, follow the path. It is narrow. Those who are found worthy will receive everlasting life. But number, number two, here's the point. Not many want to walk the difficult path. All right. if, it is a, if it seems difficult, this is just kind of the way mankind is. If it seems narrow, they don't want to follow it. And it's hard to follow, so we don't want to do something that's hard. Point number three, many disbelieve. Many don't even believe that there's a destruction coming. Remember uh, Lot trying to convince the sons-in-law to come with him before the city of Sodom was destroyed, and they didn't even believe that it was true. That's a lot of people in this world, too. I think of Noah who was being narrowly saved in the ark. 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 says he was a preacher of righteousness, trying to show everybody this narrow way. I think of all the people he must have warned and likely got the same exact response that Lot did. They probably laughed him to scorn. They thought he was some crazy old coop building the giant boat in the wilderness. So let me ask you, why is salvation difficult (coughs) among mankind? Why is it described as narrow? Is it difficult because God has a hard time? No. It's described as difficult because people simply don't want to follow the way of salvation. So yes, people can be lazy. People enjoy their sin. People don't wish to do what they're told by God. They don't want to submit to anything. We as humans like things our way. But if we wish to follow God's salvation, uh, we just need to do exactly what he said and trust him with our whole heart. So number one, what should we do? I would say be diligent for the path of salvation. When Jesus told Christians that they were to flee the city of Jerusalem, he told them, don't linger. Don't stop to go back and grab your bag. Don't stop to smell the roses. Get out right away. Over and over again, that's the tone of the New Testament for those who are being saved is to be very diligent. Take it seriously. Try hard to make it out with this salvation. Uh, 2 Peter 1.10, we read earlier, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. 2 Timothy chapter 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, someone who is rightly dividing the word of truth. So yes, we need to cling to the way of salvation in a full heart of diligence, studying our Bibles, praying regularly, confessing our sins, confessing our faults to God, evaluating whether or not we've been faithful. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Paul said that we need to do this often. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So number two and number three, take it seriously and ask, seek, and knock, as Jesus said. Jesus said, if you are seeking it diligently and you really want to be part of this group that's going to go to heaven, then you'll make it. You'll make it. You've got to start asking questions and getting heaven's answers. You go look for the right way. I've given it to you. Don't sit there idle and expect it just to be handed to you. You seek it. That's our call. You ask the hard questions. You approach God and knock on his door. And Jesus says, you will find the way if that's your attitude. We must be diligent. Matthew 7, verse 8. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. And then number four, don't look back. All right, Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verse 32, remember Lot's wife. That's all he said. Remember Lot's wife. Once you started on this salvation, don't turn your attention back to the life you used to live before you became a Christian. Keep your eyes fixed forward. So our theme verse for this morning says, For the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? For if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So perhaps you're here this morning and you've not obeyed this glorious gospel that the verse referenced. You've not heard the gospel, believed, repented, confessed, and were baptized into Christ to become part of his church. Maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel at all. So if you have not done that, I hope you'll be thinking about it. 
They obey that gospel. Maybe you are here this morning and you're in a different category. You've obeyed the gospel, but you've not been living faithfully. Maybe you're a Christian. You have sin in your life. I hope that you will take care of it this morning in whatever way you need to. So if anybody needs to come forward, please do so as we stand and sing. Oh.